I hope you enjoy the session. And inshallah, uh, it's going to be a quick one, so you can any, enjoy your iftar, inshallah. Okay, so for our today's topic, it's amino acid degradation. And um, it's it's quite an easy one, a quick one as well. It just needs a lot of memorization for, for the enzymes and the reactions and the cofactors. But inshallah, we're going to go through it together and make it easy. Okay, so let us start. And these are the objectives. So uh, before we begin, we have to understand uh, what is the difference between the different types of amino acids. So we have glucogenic and ketogenic, and this is the way we classified them. Uh, glucogenic is like they are going to be converted into glucose. They love glucose. They will become glucose or any of the glucose intermediates. The other category, which is ketogenic, uh, they love fats and they will become ketone bodies or like lipids basically. Um, and the end product is they will give us energy. Both glucogenic and ketogenic amino acids are going to be incorporated into the metabolic pathways respectively, like you know, the glucose pathway and the lipid pathway or the fatty acid pathway to give us energy. Um, Okay, so uh, we have glucogenic amino acids, ketogenic amino acids, and then both like amino acids that can that are very flexible that can become uh, ketogenic and glucogenic depending on the enzyme that are being uh, the enzyme that's basically degrading them. Okay, so um, let's classify them. Uh, like let's know what are the amino acids. Okay, so first, uh, the double L's loves K. So double L's is leucine and lysine. They are purely ketogenic. This is very easy to remember because they are the two L's and they are only the, the purely ketogenic amino acids. Okay, and then you have the triple T's, iso and fen. Like I call them that, it's like a little mnemonic. Let's triple T's, iso and fen. So triple T's are threonine, tryptophan, and tyrosine. Iso is like isoleucine, and fen is like phenylalanine. They love Kg. So Kg here is a ketogenic, uh, ketogenic and glucogenic. Okay, and the rest, they are top G. Basically, they are just glucogenic. Okay, so. This is an easy way to remember, and this is like a Venn diagram if you guys want to remember all of this. But it is easier to remember that it's lysine, lysine, ketogenic. The triple T's, iso, and fen are both, and the rest, like you can list the rest of the 13 amino acids. So it can be like purely ketogenic. Okay, so um, how do we decide if I am going to be a ketogenic amino acid or a top G, which is like a glucogenic amino acid, it depends on the intermediate I'm going to become. So remember guys, in the beginning, we said ketogenic will be incorporated into the lipid or the fatty acid pathway. Glucogenic will be incorporated into the pathways of glucose, which basically are the intermediates of the TCA cycle. Uh, because if you guys remember from mold one, you have these intermediates, then we will go into the process of gluconeogenesis to make glucose, okay? So we have pyruvate, oxaloacetate, alpha ketoglutarate, succinyl CoA, and fumarate. These are the siblings or like the brothers of pyruvate. If any of the um, amino acids that we have, like these 13, um, they'll be converted into any of these uh, five different intermediates, they're going to be uh, glucogenic. Okay. Okay. What makes me. Uh, uh, ketogenic, I will be converted, I will, be, I will become acetyl-CoA or acetoacetyl-CoA. And if you guys studied your uh, fatty acid synthesis pathway, uh, sorry, fatty acid synthesis lecture, uh, you have acetyl-CoA as, you know, the subunit or the building block of the fatty acid chain. So any amino acid which is going to become uh, acetyl-CoA or acetoacetate, it is going to be called ketogenic. Okay, and what are the ketogenic amino acids? The purely ketogenic are lysine, leucine. The rest are, are like, you know, the, the amino acids that are also ketogenic, but also are um, glucogenic. They are um, uh, isoleucine, phenylalanine, and the triple T's, tryptophan, terionine, and tyrosine. Okay, so um, this is basically a summary. You can read this, but to just summarize this slide, if I'm going to be a ketogenic amino acid, I will be converted into acetyl-CoA or acetoacetate. If I'm going to be a, a glucogenic amino acid, I'll become pyruvate and the brother of or like the rest of the siblings, um, basically intermediate of the TCA cycle. Okay. Okay. Um, before going into the separate, you know, metabolic pathways of each uh, group of amino acid, we have to know the locations of them. So most of our location, uh, most of our metabolic uh, metabolism is happening in the liver. Most of the reactions, all of them, um, 
whether it's degradation, synthesis, storage, everything, uh, mostly it's in the liver. But we also have like, you know, sub tissues, if you would like to call them, we have muscles and adipose tissue. And uh, why is it important to know them? Because the location the, uh, of the enzyme is important. Um, okay, so whatever is in the liver is called intrahepatic, outside of the liver, extrahepatic, and extrahepatic tissues can be like muscle, adipose, kidneys in some cases. Okay, so uh, what decides where am I going to be metabolized? It's what is the size of elements. In other words, it's the enzyme. So where is the enzyme? If it's in the liver, then I will be an intrahepatically metabolized um, pathway, for example. If I am in the muscle, I will be extrahepatic muscle um, um, location, okay? So uh, what we need to know for the location here is that the branched chain amino acid, which is the BACA, I like to call them the BACA, is in the muscles. Okay, why? Because the muscle, uh, sorry, the enzyme that degrades these branched chain amino acids is in the muscle and not in the liver. Okay, so if you get a question uh, about the branched chain amino acid, like for example, uh, valine is a branched chain amino acid, and they, and they asked where is the, metabol um, the location of this metabolism or where is the enzyme located? It is not in the liver, don't be, you know, confused because it, it should be in the muscle because the enzyme is in the muscle and not in the liver. However, the rest of the pathways or the rest of the metabolic um, reactions we're going to talk about will happen in the liver, except this branch chain amino acids. Okay, it's very straightforward. Okay, so this is like a very quick question. Uh, which of the following amino acid is glucogenic and essential? Um, okay, so remember in wall one, we also classified amino acid into essential and non-essential amino acid. And we said the essential amino acid had the uh, mnemonic PVT Tim Hall. So which one of the of these amino acids like in this uh, mnemonic? It's PVT V valine. So it's, it's, but it's also glucogenic because if you guys remember this, um, uh, what is it? A Venn diagram? It's here. <laughs> valine is here. Okay, and we're going to talk about valine later on. Uh, okay, so the straightforward, easy reactions, I call them the three A's and the two G's. The three A's will be alanine, aspartate, and aspergine. The two G's were going to be glutamate and glutamine. And um, they are very easy reaction. You just need to remember this, like, um, what do you call it? A sign or you know yeah sign it's six so it should remind me it should remind you of the b6 which is a very important cofactor in these um reactions if you don't have b6 or if you are deficient in b6 you cannot convert you know for example alanine into pyruvate uh and this is important because if you don't go forward with the reaction this element for example is going to accumulate and you're going to see it in the urine and uh sometimes it can cause disorders and etc okay so uh, you need to know the difference between transamination and deamination. So transamination is basically transferring an amino group, this is an amino group, from the amino acids, for example, like alanine, into a keto acid to produce a new product. So a new product is pyruvate. It's not a new amino, it's not like, for example, a new amino acid, it didn't become glycine, for example. So this is transamination. If you have a completely new product, uh, which originated from an amino acid, it is called transamination. And the enzymes for transamination is um, transferases. So ALT is alanine amino transferase. This is the T. And all of them you know, require a B6 uh, cofactor. The same thing, aspartate is going to become oxaloacetate. Again, a new product. It's not an amino acid. That's why it is a transamination. Glutamate, uh, this is glutamate dehydrogenase, also requiring B6. It'll become alpha ketoglutarate. Alpha ketoglutarate, it's not an amino acid. That's why this reaction is a transamination reaction. Got it? So to summarize, transamination reaction is converting an amino acid into a new product uh, by transferring an amino group, okay? Which is like this and then NH2. And most of them will require B6. And these are the enzymes, alanine amino transferase, aspartate amino transferase, and um, glutamate dehydrogenase. okay? And if you guys notice that pyruvate, oxaloacetate, and ketoglutarate are intermediates of the TCA cycle, and that's why these amino acids are glucogenic. Okay, next step, deamination. Deamination is not transferring that, it's removing this amino group from an amino acid to produce ammonia and sometimes another amino acid. So. Uh, you have this example, aspargine, it's an amino acid. You will use this enzyme aspartaminase, which is basically breaking down this aspartine into aspartate. So this amino acid became another amino acid and that's why it is called deamination. And D in like, you know, the medical terminology is like removing something. So 
decarboxylase is, is removing glucose, the amination is removing this amine group. So we are removing this amine group and we are producing a new amino acid. Okay, and sometimes you'll produce ammonia, but I didn't put it in this you know, reaction so you don't get confused. Okay, so aspergine, aspergenase will become aspartate, glutamine become glutamate, uh, by glutaminase will become glutamate. And if you want to link it, aspartate will then become oxaloacetate and glutamate will become alpha ketoglutarate. Okay, I hope it makes sense. Now, next, uh, yeah, this is you know the difference between the amination and transamination. We are basically transferring this NH group, uh, uh, which is like the amino group, and don't mind you know the signs. This is basically in its ionic form, but we are converting or like transferring this amino group into another new compound. Okay, and here the amination we are uh, removing it and producing ammonia here, removing it. It's not in the structure, and glutamate is becoming um, you know another product. Okay, so breaking amino acid can treat cancer. Oh, this is, um, you know, a clinical case. So uh, aspergine, aspergine into aspargenase to produce aspartate. This is the reaction. So they found that um, cancer cells, you know, guys, it's, um, I mean, it's highly mutagenic cell that wants to replicate and nothing else. It just wants to multiply to form a mass that we call a tumor, and this is basically cancer. So cancer cells, obviously, like all cells, will require energy. And through research, we found that um, cancer cells cannot make their own aspergine, and uh, all cells will require all types of amino acids, all of them. The 20 types of amino acids are very essential for all of the cells, including cancer cells, for them to you know, replicate and multiply. So we found through research that if you, for example, example, broke and break down the aspartate into asp uh, aspartate and uh, through this, you know, drug kind of thing, which, you know, uh, it's an enzyme, but we made it a drug, which is L-aspartinase, we will break down the aspergine and you, the cell, the cancer cell will not have its aspergine source. And we knew, we know that it doesn't, it cannot make its own aspergine. And that's why it will be deprived. If you are deprived or the cell, if the cell is deprived of its essential nutrients, it will not multiply. It will not have energy to multiply. And the, then the cell will die. So this is basically a clinical case. If you give L-aspartinase uh, to a cancer cell, or sorry, to a cancer patient, it can target the cancer cells uh, and deprive it from its own aspergine source, which is kind of interesting if you ask me. Okay. Okay, so the next reaction uh, uh, set is like phenylalanine and tyrosine. Uh, what you need to know, because it's going to be discussed in later lectures as well, like, you know, the metabolism of tyrosine into other um, uh, compounds like neurotransmitters and etc. cetera, uh, you just need to know for this lecture specifically this reaction. So phenylalanine will become phenylalanine hydro through this enzyme, phenylalanine hydroxylase into tyrosine. And tyrosine, um, as you said, if you remember from the Venn diagram, the triple T's, tyrosine, threonine, and tryptophan is both glucogenic and ketogenic. And um, what does that depend on? It depends on the enzyme that met metabolizing it. So if tyrosine went through the glucogenic pathway, it would become fumarate. And that's why it can be a glucogenic amino acid. However, if it went through the ketogenic pathway, this will become acetoacetate, and that's why it is also considered ketogenic. But for this you know, slide, just know that phenylalanine can become tyrosine through phenylalanine hydroxylase, which is this enzyme, so just the hydroxylase. Okay, and what is the cofactor? It is BH4 or like um, biotin, okay? So uh, it is required if you don't have biotin, if you are deprived of biotin, or if you have a biotin deficiency, you cannot go through this pathway. You will have accumulated phenylalanine, and later on we call that phenylketonuria, but don't worry about it for now. But um, if, you have accumulate, uh, if you have accumulated substance, it will be toxic. But if you are deprived of this substance, you will have, you will have deficiency in tyrosine. And um, tyrosine, is, sorry, uh, tyrosine is important for later on. Uh, just keep in mind for this lecture, it's going to be converted into neurotransmitters like norepinephrine, epinephrine, and dopamine. Okay, but this is you know, two lectures after this specific lecture. Um, okay, so yeah, let's move ahead. So we are done from uh, three A's, two G's, alanine, and then we are done from phenylalanine and tyrosine. Now we go through the, you know, serine, threonine, glycine. Like uh, this is a swear to God mnemonic, but you know, in our lecture, it's going to be serine, threonine, and glycine. Okay, so um, threonine, if you remember, it is 
both ketogenic and glucogenic. However, serine and glycine both are purely glucogenic. Okay, serine is glucogenic because it is being converted into pyruvate, which is an intermediate of the TCA. It's going to become glucose uh, by gluconeogenesis. That's why it's gluco uh, glucogenic. And it, it can be converted into glycine. Remember when we said um, an amino acid into another amino acid, this is called like a deamination reaction. Uh, serine and glycine, uh, serine can be converted into glycine through this, you know, reaction. Uh, three union, it is one of the triple T's. So it can, as we said, it's like a KG ketogenic because it will be converted into acetyl-CoA and glucogenic because it is going to be converted into pyruvate and sometimes it's succinyl coy okay? But also it will be converted into glycine. So serine and threonine will be converted into glycine. Uh, why is this significant? Because if you have excess glycine, it will be converted into this type of re, uh, compound, which is called glycooxalate. And glycooxalate, it will be broken down into oxalate. And then oxalate is important. You know, it's like um, it can bind to calcium, and then it will form crystals. We call them oxalate crystals. And then they, this type of reaction, when where oxalate binds to calcium to form these crystals, it's in the kidney stones. And if you know, if you have like, um, you know. Imagine with me like a salt granule and then you add another salt granule to make like a small um, stone kind of thing. It will, uh, yeah, it's a stone basically. So it will block the ureter and the urethra and etc. So you'd have kidney stones. So it is important uh, in a patient with, for example, a renal failure or um, a patient who has like history of kidney stones to monitor his or hers. Uh, glycine level because it can be quickly converted into glycooxalate and glycooxalate is basically degraded into oxalate and oxalate has a very high affinity to calcium forming these kidney stones um, forming oxalate crystals which are basically kidney stones okay this is basically just our action to show you that glycooxalate you don't need to know this it's just like a random picture from google but glycooxalate will become oxalate and then they will form kidney stones okay uh, this is a summary slide for what we just talked about. Threonine is, it can be converted into succinyl coa pyruvate. That's why it's glucogenic here. But if it went through the pathway of like the ketogenic pathway uh, to form acetyl coa, that's why it's ketogenic. Serine, ignore this part. Serine can be converted into pyruvate. That's why serine is glucogenic. Both of them will be converted into glycine. Glycine will become glycooxalate, forming oxalate. And if you, are, if you have it in excess, it will cause kidney stone. Pretty straightforward, inshallah. Okay, um, another step, uh, another point in this you know, type of reaction is like glyc glycine cleavage reaction. Okay, so guys, uh, this is the, one second, yeah, this is the structure of glycine, okay? So uh, if you can, no, no, never mind. I'm not going to confuse you with structure, sorry about that. But glycine, basically in its structure, it has one carbon and it's the smallest amino acid. Okay, that's why we can take this carbon and uh, you know donate it to other compounds that need this carbon. And these are basically like cars. They are transport, transporters of this carbon group, for example, a methyl group, uh, and it will be incorporated into other reactions later on. Okay, so glycine is our primary carbon donor in the body, and it gives its carbon, it donates it to this compound right here. It's called tetrahydrofolate. And um, I'm not really sure if you guys took it in the heme block uh, in FND, uh, but tetrahydrofolate is important in DNA synthesis. And it's basically a derivative of folate, which is vitamin B9. So where do we get this extra methyl group? We get it from glycine. So what we need to know is that glycine is a source of one carbon unit, or it's a carbon donor for tetrahydrofolate. Okay, what is the tetrahydrofolate? It's B9, it is important for um, DNA synthesis. Keep this in mind, we are going to repeat this point again in later in this lecture, and you're also going to take it in, inshallah, in the future in nucleotide synthesis, okay? So uh, role of glycine in THF, basically just one carbon donor, and it donates a methylene group, which is basically uh, one carbon group with hydrogens there, here and there, okay? So yeah, just one carbon. Glycine will donate one carbon to whatever the source is, and the source here is THF or tetrahydrofolate. Okay, let's move on. Um, Okay, we are done now. This is another set of reactions, methionine and cysteine, and they are united by sulfur. 
sulfur. Why are they uh, why are they grouped in this specific format? Because both of these amino acids have sulfur. Uh, if you remember in mole one, you know that they have sulfur, but only cysteine will ca uh, can form you know the disulfide bonds. Um, okay. So methionine, uh, it will be converted into succinyl CoA. Succinyl CoA is one of the brothers of pyruvate, and that is why it's gluco uh, glucogenic. Uh, cysteine is the same thing. It will be converted into pyruvate, and that's why it's also glucogenic. Okay, so this is basically the summary of later slides that we're going. Just like, give me a minute. We're going to discuss, but methionine through a very very long pathway, it can be converted into cysteine. Okay, so what is special about cysteine, and why methionine can be converted into cysteine? Because if you look at the structure of cysteine, uh, you will find that the carbon skeleton, you know, the basic carbon units and the hydrogens around it is the same structure as serine. But what is special is just we added another sulfur group. And this sulfur is from methionine, okay? So a serine carbon skeleton or carbon structure and a sulfur group from methionine will form, will be, will give us the structure of cysteine, okay? Uh, okay, so uh, hypothetically speaking, if you want to degrade the cysteine, you have a lot of cysteine in your body and you want to break it down, what will you break it down into? You would break it down into the substances that made it. So serine, sulfur, pretty straightforward. Now serine, uh, if you remember from the reaction, um, you know, the group of reactions that we just discussed, serine can be converted into pyruvate, can be converted into uh, glycine, okay? Sulfur um, is a compound, it's like, a, yeah, it is a compound, but it's, uh, you know, a metabolite that's just going to be excreted in the urine as sulfate. Uh, just a rule of thumb, guys, if anything which accumulates or anything that we don't need, we're just going to get rid of it through the kidneys, through urine, okay? Uh, okay, so this is the set of the reactions. Um, bear with me, it is just basically a summary. I'm going to like spend quite a lot of time in this reaction, in this slide, sorry. Um, but it is basically, this is the summary of it. Inshallah, it's going to be easy. So um, ultimately the goal is to pr produce cysteine. Okay, so methionine into cysteine. Um, yalla, step by step. Methionine, uh, we need this enzyme, which is called methionine aminotransferase, which produces uh, uh, which produces this compound called SAM. Okay, S here. Uh, I don't really remember the mnemonic for it, but S is the sulfur group, and this is amino something. Okay, let me check, and I'm going to tell you. But uh, the, the S here is sulfur. So S here is sulfur. S here is sulfur. Okay. Anyways, methionine will be converted into SAM, and SAM uh, through which uh, enzyme? It's uh, methionine aminotransferase, and this requires ATP. Okay. Um, it was mentioned in your lecture, but I don't think it's important, but the doctor just pointed out that um, um, this SAM compound, it doesn't have phosphate. Um, okay, just, I wanted to mention that to just not miss anything, but uh, SAM doesn't have phosphate, but we need ATP for this reaction to occur. So methionine aminotransferase enzyme or MAT enzyme will require SAM, uh, will, sorry, will require ATP to produce SAM. Okay, SAM then will go through this reaction, a methyl transferase reaction producing CH3, which is a methyl group, and SA, like this is S adenyl homocysteine, I think. Okay, so um, through a methyl transferase from the name of the enzyme, methyl CH3 group or a methyl group, transferase will transfer it. So it will take a CH3 from this compound and it will form a normal CH3, and then it will produce um, the rest or like the remaining compound is this S adenyl, uh, aden adenyl seen homocysteine. So that just that, okay? It's a very long name. Um, SAH or SA has H, which is which stands for homocysteine. It will be degraded into homocysteine and adenosine, okay? And the homocysteine will go through this process through two processes, okay? So the first process, which our which is our main goal, is to produce cysteine. Homocysteine will become cysteine through this trans transsulfuration reaction, which is basically removing a sulfur group. And uh, this requires B6, okay? So homocysteine with B6 will produce cysteine. Okay, the other uh, route that homocysteine can take, it's the remethylation route. So we take this CH3, put it here in this reaction with B12 and B9 to produce methionine again. So it is basically a cycle, okay? So methionine will go become SAM, SAM will become SA, SA will become homocysteine. Homocysteine can become methionine again if it took this remethylation route 
and this requires B12 and B9. But if it wants to produce cysteine, you will uh, use B6 through transsulfuration reaction to produce cysteine, okay? So I hope it made sense. Just for you know, memorize, this is basically the summary of it all. And this is the picture from your slides. Um, you know, these are the steps. Methionine will become SAM. So uh, S here, finally, S here is adenosyl methionine, SAM, and it doesn't have a sulfur, uh, sorry, a phosphate group. Then uh, with a methyl transferase enzyme, it will become homocysteine, uh, it will become SA, sorry, and then SA will become degraded into homocysteine, and then it can become methionine again through B12. So it's a cycle. But if you want to produce cysteine, we will require B6. Okay. Um, this is a um, question. So a five-year-old gir uh, girl with moderate me mental retardation is brought to the physician by her mother, who is concerned that her daughter has been having difficulty with her vision for weeks. The physical examination shows a fair complexion and a malar arrhythmia, uh, ar arrhythmia, sorry. Uh, opth uh, ophthalmo ophthalmologic examination shows dislocated lenses bilaterally. She has long, slender hands and fingers. Blood test reveals her cystathionine concentration is below normal. So this is the keyword. This patient is most likely having an increased urine concentration of which of the following amino acids. So this is basically just, you know, the, the clinical presentation of this patient. But your keyword to answer this question is your urine test reveals that her cystathionine concentration is below normal. Okay. Just to mention here, cystathionine is just the step before producing uh, cysteine you, it wasn't mentioned in your lecture but just if you if you so you don't get confused okay so which are the following amino acids um which amino acid of these produces cystathionine or like cyst uh, cysteine it's methionine so this is the answer pretty straightforward okay so the moral of the story don't waste your time reading this clinical picture just look for the last line in most of the mole um, or biochemistry questions okay don't do this for all of the questions just you know, look for the last line in most of the questions. And the answer is methionine. Okay, hope it made sense. Now for the other uh, set of reactions, we have histidine metabolism. Okay, so this is basically to just remind, me, remind you, like, hey, hist can become glue, so histidine can become glutamate. Um, glutamate. And this is, the, you know, the intermediate. NF glue, N is the nitrogen and uh, F is a formyl group um, and blue is glutamate. So together it's like nitrogen, uh, formyl, glutamate, uh, but you know, no freaking way it's glue. So glutamate, this is the compound that you need to remember. And yes, it did that nine to 12 times. Um, leave it for now. We're going to discuss it later, but histidine, can become uh, glutamate through this pathway or like this reaction. And the intermediate here is this uh, NF glue, okay? So um, NF glue is just basically an intermediate. And uh, if you remember guys, this is a reaction glutamate, what does it become? If you guys would like to answer, I don't know if someone entered the meeting or not, but um, Glutamate will become alpha ketoglutarate if you remember from the beginning of the reactions. Okay, but this is the intermediate of this uh, NF glue and it will require THF. Um, in previous slides, we mentioned THF is tetrahydrofolate and uh, uh, you know a derivative of B9, which is a vitamin. B9 is folate. Okay, um, which slide is this? Let's go. It's the glycine slide. Yes. So tetrahydrofolate. Is the B9 and it's required in DNA synthesis. It will take one carbon from glycine, but it, it, in itself, this compound, it's a transporter of methyl groups. Okay. Um, okay. So NF glue uh, will give or donate its nitrogen. This N here, it's a donation like complex. Nitrogen, uh, it will donate nitrogen to tetrahydrofolate. Tetrahydrofolate now will gain nitrogens. And depending on the location of where this nitrogen atom is placed and the structure of tetrahydrofolate, we number them, okay? So uh, N5 is basically nitrogen on the fifth carbon and 10 is nitrogen on the 10th carbon. So this NF glue is very generous. It can give uh, the tetrahydrofolate, the nitrogen in the fifth position, in the 10th position, or in both of them. So it can give nitrogen anywhere, depending on the, you know, the the kinetics of the reaction. 
So th this group will then form um, nucleotides, purines, and pyrimidines for DNA synthesis later on. Okay, so this is mentioned in your lecture. You don't need to know that, but if you keep it in your mind for later lectures, uh, like nucleotide synthesis, it will be easier for you. Okay, so tetrahydrofolate, if the nitrogen is in the fifth position, it can help us in the remethylation of homocysteine into methionine. Because remember, in this reaction, guys, homocysteine with methionine, it will require B12 and B9. And guess what tetrahydrofolate is? It's basically B9. Okay, um, if NF blue donated and uh, the nitrogen in the 10th position, and we have N10 tetrahydrofolate, then we will produce purines. And if you remember in mole one, purines are alanine and guanine. Uh, sorry, uh, I have to remove this. It's adenosine and guanine, my mistake. Uh, okay, uh, N5 is, and N10, if it donated in both positions, now we have two, car and two nitrogen groups in the tetrahydrofolate, then it will aid in the uh, synthesis of pyrimidines, and pyrimidines are thymine, uracil, and cytosine. Okay, this bit right here, it's later for nucleotide synthesis, but if you keep this uh, you know, slide in mind, um, it will help you and you can link stuff together. Okay, and that brings us to this part right here. Yes, and I did that nine to 12 times because it requires B9 and 12 and B12 for these type of reaction. But the moral of the story here is a histidine can become glutamate through an F glue. Okay. You don't need there are no enzymes mentioned here. Just you know this know that this is the intermediate in this reaction. Okay. Uh, clinicals. Okay. So F glue compound excretion test is to check for B9 deficiency. Okay. And a positive test is when you find F glue in this uh, in, in the urine, that means that you are deficient in B9. And why is that? Because um, you require B9 and F glue will be converted into THF. And if you are deficient in B9, if you don't have the enzyme requiring it, and then this will accumulate. And whenever anything accumulates, it will go through the urine. And that is why you can test for this B9 deficiency through this um, F glue urine test. And you will have high, um, you know, high levels of formaldehyde glutamate in, this, in the urine, okay? Okay, uh, another clinical case is B9 and B12 deficiency and it causes megaloblastic anemia. Again, guys, uh, THF is uh, tetrahydrofolate and we said like um, more of the story, it is required for DNA synthesis, right? B12 is also required for DNA synthesis. If you don't have enough uh, nucleotides or like you don't have, you know, the basic uh, subunits, or building blocks to make the big DNA. And DNA is a very essential step in mitosis where you have replication of the cell. Um, you are basically lacking the maturation of the cell. And this affects particularly red blood cells. And um, red blood cells, if you remember in your heme block, immature red blood cells are big cells and mature red blood cells are smaller, okay? Um, if you are not, going through the normal mitotic cycle and if you're not going through the proper DNA synthesis because you're deficient in some uh, vitamins, B9 and 12, you will have a condition called megaloblastic anemia, okay? So you don't have enough DNA synthesis or the DNA synthesis is impaired, the replication of the cells is impaired and the, there is lack of maturation. And um, if you remember that uh, immature red blood cells are erythroblast, this is the name, that's why it's blast and mega because they are big cells. You know, if you see in the blood stain that you have big red blood cells, this is a sign of megaloblastic anemia. Okay, okay, now uh, B12 uh, alone, B12 deficiency alone, uh, B12, another name for it is cobalamin, and just FYI is B9 is folate. Okay, B9, uh, B12, if you remember in your GI block, when we uh, take it from our food resources. It has to be bound to this intrinsic factor in our stomach, so this B12 can be absorbed, okay? If you lack uh, intrinsic factor due to some mutation or you are um, like an elderly patient who has the storage of intrinsic factor like um, less, like from a normal person, uh, you will not have a proper absorption of B12 in your body, and that's why when a patient comes in with B12 deficiency, you don't give tablets or pills or oral pills because it's going to be useless. It's not going to be absorbed anyways. 
So what is the solution for this patient who is B12 deficient? We give it IV, okay? Now, a cofactor in, uh, okay, another function for B12 is a cofactor in remethylation of histine, uh, hist uh, hist uh, sorry, homocysteine to methionine, if you guys remember this reaction again, uh, B12 and B9, okay? So B12 is also a cofactor. And it is a cofactor in branched chain amino acid metabolism. We're going to talk about it in, like in a few slides. And it is also required in the isomersion of methyl malonyl CoA into saxonyl CoA in odd chain fatty acid synthesis. Uh, sorry, uh, metabolism, so degradation. So uh, four things now. Intrinsic factor is required for B12 metabolism. It is also required in methylation of homocysteine to methionine. It is required as a cofactor in branched chain amino acid uh, metabolism, and is also required in odd chain fatty acid metabolism. Okay. So again, if you have um, a deficiency in something, one compound will be accumulated, another compound will be deficient, okay? Um, research also has found that if you have accumulation of odd-chain fatty acids because you are lacking B12, you are lacking B12, you cannot metabolize this odd-chain fatty acids, these odd-chain fatty acids are going to accumulate and uh, for they have receptors on neurons. And when they get incorporated into the cell membranes of neurons, you will have CNS disorders and neurological manifestations and um, severe diseases, uh, you know, a subacute combined degeneration. Um, it is an interesting case. If you want to read about it, you're going to take it in neuro, but you know, I just wanted to link it uh, with B12 deficiency. It was also mentioned in your lecture. Just know that it's the accumulation of our chain fatty acids that is going to cause CNS disorders and neurologic manifestations. And that's it. Okay. Uh, this is, you know, the the reactions from your side. Um, homocysteine and methionine, it requires B12. And this is the enzyme methionine synthase. Uh, and odd chain fatty acids will become methyl malonyl CoA with methyl malonyl CoA mutase, which is an enzyme requiring B12 as well. It can produce saxonyl CoA. We're going, um, I think you should have taken this reaction in the fatty acid synthesis lecture. Okay. Now um, we are almost done. And wow, that didn't take so long. So that's good. Uh, Valine, Lucy, and, uh, Lucy and Lucy's cousin. These are the branch chain amino acids. So this is the mnemonic if you want to remember it. And, the, and Dr. Hanna likes to call isoleucine Lucy's cousin, and that's why I added it here. But the branch chain amino acids are valine, leucine, and isoleucine, which is Lucy's cousin. Okay? So valine is glucogenic. Uh, leucine is ketogenic. Why? Because it, is, because it is one of the L's, leucine and lysine. And isoleucine is both ketogenic and uh, glucogenic because it is the triple T's, iso and fen, okay, from, you know, the beginning of the lecture. Okay, so branch chain amino acids are also called keto acids, so you can call them branch chain keto acids for some reason, because they have a keto group, I think. So they are degraded by a dehydrogenase enzyme, and we call this enzyme branch chain keto acid dehydrogenase, and this enzyme, keto acid dehydrogenase, it's going to, you know, it, ha it has the same structure as pyruvate dehydrogenase. Pyruvate dehydrogenase, if you remember, it was um, in between, you know, the reaction of glycolysis and uh, TCA, where we converted pyruvate into acetyl-CoA. By this enzyme, we call pyruvate dehydrogenase, okay? Um, what we need to know is that uh, branch chain keto acid dehydrogenase is, has the same structure as pyruvate dehydrogenase. What does that mean? If it has the same structure, it will require the same cofactors. And if you guys remember again from mole one, then these are the cofactors that PDH required. These are also the cofactors that this keto acid dehydrogenase will require. So what are these cofactors? Thiamine pyrophosphate, which is B1. Thiamine is B1. Lipoic acid, uh, vitamin B5, or also called panthenic acid, also called CoA. Again, uh, another uh, cofactor is B2, which is also called FAD FADH2 and also called riboflavin, and then B3, niacin, or NADH. So just remember, B1, 2, 3, 5, and lipoic acid are the cofactors of um, branch chain keto acid dehydrogenase. Okay, here it's the thing, if you remember, pyruvate dehydrogenase is from pyruvate acetyl-CoA. Um, again, this is a reaction in the TCA cycle, but what we need to know for this lecture, it is used in branch chain keto acid dehydrogenase for these amino acids to produce propionyl-CoA, okay? 
and this is a summary slide. Um, this you don't need to know all of this. Just know that this these three trios, valine, isoleucine, and leucine, are going to become keto acid, and through uh, and through this enzyme branch chain keto acid dehydrogenase, which requires these cofactors, it will form these different products. Um, but but the product that they um, share is propionyl CoA. Okay, which going to talk about it just right now. Okay, propionyl CoA pathway. Um, this is the pathway and. With that, guys, we are going to be over, I promise. So propionyl-CoA uh, is going to become succinyl-CoA through two reactions, okay? So first, the first step is propionyl-CoA into malonyl-CoA. Malonyl-CoA uh, through this a carboxylase enzyme, propionyl-CoA carboxylase. The malonyl-CoA will become succinyl-CoA through methylmalonyl-CoA mutase. So two, sorry, two steps, propionyl to malonyl by a carboxylase, Malonyl to succinyl by a mutase. It's kind of a tongue twister, but it's, I hope it's like easy. Okay, what are these amino acids that are going to produce propionyl CoA? Just, we should, just mentioned valine, isoleucine, and leucine, and also uh, methionine. And this is, you know, the reaction, also three unique. This is the, sorry, the mnemonic. So Valerie, Threo, and Lucy's cousin, which is isoleucine, got meth. So, you know, the drug and made propio potion. So just, you know, the made it mix. This is just a way to remember um, what are the amino acids that can be converted into propionyl CoA. The branch chain amino acids, which are val uh, valine, isoleucine, and leucine. Uh, also the these two, threonine and methionine. Both of them will become propionyl CoA. Again, propionyl CoA through a carboxylase will become malonyl. Malonyl through a mutase will become succinyl. Okay. And this is a question, and um, let's solve it together. So uh, a five-month-old infant has been experiencing lethargy, recurrent vomiting, respiratory distress, and this is basically what the clinical presentation. The lab results indicate severe metabolic ketoacidosis associated with extreme accumulation of methylmalonic acid in the blood and the urine. So this is the keyword. Okay, you have negative finding of uh, pernicious anemia, hematologic and neurologic symptoms of cobalamin, which is B12 deficiency, um, indicate that the infant is suffering from a defect in which of the following enzyme. Okay, before we answer this question, I want you to remember that um, when we talked about uh, this clinical vignette, we said that B12 is required in the methylmalonide CoA pathway and in the branch chain amino acid uh, metabolism. So, uh, they, these couple of slides, all of them will require B12, uh, which is, you know, the clinical presentation in this question because he has accumulation of methylmalonic acid and he has cobalamin deficiency. That makes the enzyme which we lack or like def uh, deficient in is methylmalonyl CoA mutase. Okay, why? Because remember this reaction here. You don't have B12. You don't have. Uh, you, you have um, decreased level of methylmalonyl CoA mutase. A function, uh, and thus you have accumulation of methyl malonic acid, which is which appeared in the urine in our case. Okay, so this is the reaction, and um, surprise, surprise, we are done. Alhamdulillah. I hope I covered everything, and I hope I made it easy for you guys. Inshallah, uh, you ace this lecture. It's very straightforward. Um, my tip is for my tip for this lecture is just to list all the reactions with the cofactors in one you know, paper, PDF, or whatever you like. So you can look at it and just um, review it. It's, um, and that's it for me. Uh, please scan the code. And it's very important. It's even more important than this lecture itself. And give us the feedback. I hope you guys enjoyed this session. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact me. And my contact information is in the beginning of the slides. And I'd like to thank uh, my very good friend, Nam, for designing this very amazing presentation for me. She's amazing. So yeah, and thanks. Um, and that's it. I hope you have a good iftar. And uh, Ramadan Kareem, everyone. Thank you so much. We can stop the